REC is an exciting organization, which they can tell you about a bit. They've been doing this work for 11 years, so they really know what they're doing. And they are a student-founded and um, youth-led organization. Um, there's a lot to learn from, so get your food. Be quiet about getting your food. Take a seat. Sit next to someone you don't know. Sit next to a friend. Maybe you met someone cute last night and you want to sit next to them. I met my husband at NASCO Institute, so anything can happen. But anyway, please take a seat and give a round of applause for Lauren and Ian. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, yeah, we, also, we just wanted to thank you all uh, for being here. We want to thank the NASCO Institute. Um, oh, can you, can you hear me okay? All right. Okay, I thought I was loud, but it's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we just want to thank you, Morgan, first of all, for those words. Uh, it's really great working with you in New York. Um, and we also wanted to thank you all for being here. Thank the NASCO Institute. This is a first for me and Lauren uh, being here uh, at, the, at the Institute. And um, it's something that we've been really excited about for the last few months. I was a student cooperator, um, and I was involved in uh, student divestment movements at my school. Actually, we were kind of curious to know how many people here have been involved in divestment campaigns at your Okay, I see, yeah. Make some noise nice. if you're a divestment organizer. <laughs> yeah. That's really awesome. And because one of the reasons why I was so excited was because sometimes I felt that my involvement in cooperatives and my involvement in student movements uh, on campus were sometimes compartmentalized, which really didn't make any sense to me because a lot of the motivation for me was actually coming from the same place. Uh, so it's really great to be here with you all connecting those things. And hi, everyone. My name's Lauren. Um, I work with for the Responsible Endowments Coalition as our campaigns director. I've been organizing for about eight years. Um, I started this in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm originally from all over Washington State um, and have experience fighting the coal export facilities along the Northwest Coast. Um, have also worked on student debt organizing as someone who graduated with more than $30,000 in student debt. Um, and I'm really excited to kind of merge um, uh, many of my passions for um, our divestment work with um, a new push for reinvesting money into community cooperatives that are led by people on the front lines of extraction. Um, and we are going to be talking for the next 40 minutes or so about the ways in which we found ourselves in the mess that we're in um, with our universities putting profit before people um, and the ways in which student organizing has uh, given us the power to overcome some of these terrible policies in the past. And so we don't want this just to be a conversation about us. I mean, this is really supposed to be a conversation. Um, right, okay. This is supposed to be really a conversation between all of us. Uh, so we actually wanted to start with some questions to get a sense of the room. Um, if you've thought about these questions um, and, and how they may have affected you in your own experience. And our first question is, uh, how many people here feel that if you and your family had a financial crisis today and were unable to pay your tuition, uh, how many of you think that your university would have your back and actually be able to uh, work with you and keep you in school? Uh, could we see a show of hands? Uh-huh, I see some shaking heads, so yeah, no hands, really. Okay, so not too many folks. Now this is a different question. So how many of you think that your universities would be on board with expanding housing and dining cooperatives on campus? Let's see a show of hands. How many people think their university would be on board with that? Expanding cooperatives on campus. We've got a few more hands for this one. Mm -hmm. My university was definitely said it was on board to see some expanding uh, housing cooperatives. So, uh, But just compare this with, so how many people think that your university administration would actually support uh, being run like a uh, cooperative? Say, having the board of trustees actually made up of students and faculty and staff and the people who uh, make up the university and are most affected by what happens on the university. How many people think that the university would welcome that? <laughs> okay, when pigs fly, maybe. Never, right? That's right. Um, this is something that we're going to be talking about is how um, our cooperative models actually ways um, that, that threaten some of the current structures of power and decision making that have been set up to concentrate them in the hands of a very few people on campus. Um, and before we get in, we're going to define neoliberalism, which is a core component of what we're talking about today. And before that, Ian's going to talk a little bit about how neoliberalism has shown up in his life personally. Um, all right. So yeah, I wanted to tell a little bit of my own story because I know we're talking about uh, 
universities and cooperatives here, but these are existing within a global context. And so some of the things that are affecting uh, us, where we are, uh, are actually really affecting people around the globe. And part of my story is uh, I'm, half, I'm half from uh, this country. I'm half from Tanzania. My, my mother's side of my family is, is, is from the country of Tanzania and East Africa, and most of them still live there. And uh, this has really affected who I am in terms of my political identity, uh, because Tanzania was the birthplace of African socialism, or Ujamaa, which actually, if you read about it, you'll probably recognize a lot of cooperative principles there, including the idea of shared labor and shared benefit. Uh, so my mother was actually part of the first generation educated under the system, uh, where, so in the country after independence, there were about 100 trained teachers. Uh, and nevertheless, they made education free. Public education was free. And from the time that my mother was entering grade school to the time that she left secondary school, we saw literacy rise from about 17% to over 70%. And there were similar uh, amazing uh, increases in a lot of other social measures because the government really prioritized people and the environment. Uh, but, by, but already, by the time that she was entering, um, by the time that she was entering college, uh, this was changing uh, due to a lot of economic factors outside uh, of the country. The government was going bankrupt, and uh, yeah, and um, had to borrow money from in international institutions like the International Monetary Fund or IMF. And what happened was these loans. Uh, didn't just come as money that had to be paid back after a certain period of time. They came with a lot of conditions, and these included the idea that uh, the government would have to charge money for social services now, and uh, businesses would be privatized. And so public education for free vanished. My cousins uh, never saw free public education. And, and people in my mother's generation actually had to find jobs overseas because opportunities closed down. And many actually started working at universities in this country. Um, so instead of, instead of being able to continue uh, the, the cooperative philosophies that they'd grown up with, they were actually, uh, their labor was, was moved. And this was called the brain drain, because uh, a lot of educated people had to move to other parts of the world. And this is a pattern that we see a lot with what we're going to be talking about with neoliberalism, is that people are actually forced to leave um, their own countries and forced to um, cope with these economic conditions. So the big question, what is neoliberalism? Ian's story just uh, demonstrated what neoliberalism looks like in practice, but the way that we're defining it is a ph philosophical and political project engineered to concentrate power and decision making in the hands of the private sector. And many of the ways it's implemented are through privatization, through fiscal austerity, which means stopping spending, especially government spending, um, also practices of deregulation and free trade, creating, really getting rid of protectionary measures that different countries have taken um, to ensure their own uh, economic sovereignty. And a few questions as we go through the history of how was neoliberalism designed, what is its connection to the university sector? Um, a few questions we want you to hold on to is, are who benefited from the rise of neoliberalism? Who has caused and enforced most of these changes? Who's been harmed by neoliberal policies? And who's been resisting? And we're going to be going through each of these. And um, one thing that I really want to, to highlight is this is a conversation. We're going to be presenting some information, but we really want to spend time at the end of this with you talking about the ways in which neoliberalism shows up in your lives on campus and what you've been doing about it and the way in which you see your cooperatives as agents for potentially addressing some of the, the new policies and conditions that are clamping down on uh, public services. And uh, so neoliberalism as an idea it really comes, uh, really starts happening after World War II. And so really the first uh, moment that we want to talk about uh, is going through the 50s when uh, actually a lot of the original neoliberal thinkers, I don't know, how many people here have heard the name Milton Friedman? Ooh, actually, that's what I'd say, yeah. Um, he's, and Friedrich Hayek, these are some of the people who originally came up with these ideas uh, that we see developing. And they found a home actually at the University of Chicago, not too far from here, in particularly in the School of Economics. And so in 1956, um, one of the first things we found when we were researching is that actually the University of Chicago uh, specifically recruited Chilean economists to study under these 
uh, under these uh, professors, and this is actually a picture of, of that group of people. And within 20 years, they actually worked with the CIA to overthrow the democratically elected government of Chile because it was uh, nationalizing uh, industries uh, at, for the benefit of the people and uh, replacing it with neoliberal policies that actually put business interests first, especially American businesses. Uh, and so right from the very beginning, we see that neoliberalism is actually connected with our universities, uh, both in terms of producing this knowledge and actually even making it happen and impressing people around the world as well as here. Something that's interesting, I'm, I'm sure we've been hearing a little bit of discussion around capitalism for this, uh, over the course of this weekend, and capitalism being one of the core values of it being maximizing profit over social benefit. Um, and I think something that changes with the institutionalization of neoliberalism um, out of the University of Chicago is um, kind of transcending the concept of states and state governments and really thinking about uh, the rise of corporations as new entities that have power and control within our system. And so the next big date that we have up here um, is returning us back to the United States um, in 1971 when uh, President Nixon declared a war on drugs. Uh, this is something that we are fighting today at the Responsible Endowments Coalition with our private prison divestment campaign. But some of the policies that were enacted under the war on drugs, um, really over the course of the Reagan and Bush administrations as well, included um, something called the Rockefeller drug laws. How many of you have heard of the Rockefeller drug laws? Yeah. That required mandatory minimum sentencing for the first time for, for drug offenses. And this meant that a judge that was sentencing someone for uh, possession of different drugs would have a mandatory minimum requirement of the years that they would give. And I, uh, some of these were as high as 20 years mandatory minimum sentencing, meaning they could not give anything less than that for certain crimes. Um, this has led to a 700% increase in the prison population in the United States in the last 35 years. Um, and what we've seen actually right after the, the launch of the war on drugs in the 80s was the rise of the private prison industry as well. So really outsourcing a lot of the management of the new prison infrastructure to private corporations that are turning a profit off of locking people up. Boo, yeah, we're just getting into it right now, but it yeah. gets better at the end. Um, so another, another moment, so going into the 80s, this is really when neoliberalism uh, goes from being really in the fringes to really being the center of politics. And we have President Reagan in the United States, uh, Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom, and other leaders around the world who are making this actually the central uh, centerpiece of their policies. So uh, in 1981, Reagan sent a huge signal to workers around uh, the country by um, w when uh, air traffic controllers went on strike, uh, he ordered them to return to work within 48 hours. And when 11,000 of them refused, bravely refused, uh, they were all fired. He fired them directly and actually banned them from civil service for life. So this was really a scorched earth ta a tactic. And, it, and he, he was, in so many words, telling uh, private employers across the country that they could do whatever they wanted to bring unions and labor to heal. And, and this is really a point where uh, the government really gets behind employers against labor unions. And, and, uh, and it's really a critical moment in the labor struggle. And how many of you know of adjunct union fights happening right now on your campuses where adjunct faculty members are trying to get unionization rights? That's right. So you can really trace some of the, the big crackdown on universities back to 1981 when Reagan said that the government would stand behind corporations rather than labor. In 1986, we're returning back to uh, the university space. And this is something that a lot of people don't talk about, but there was actually like a new model of investing that was invented by David Swenson, the man in this picture, um, at Yale University. It's called the endowment model of investing, and it's probably the model that your university is using right now. What it did was it shifted investment decision making um, out of liquid assets, so things like cash and bonds and stocks that were pretty safe, that you had a lot of control over, and, and really pushed funding into private equity, it pushed funding into hedge funds, and the riskier and riskier the businesses, the more lucrative Yale uh, became, and everyone started seeing, wow, like Yale's making 11 to 17 percent returns on investment, we had better take this on ourselves, uh, we had better follow suit or we're going to get left behind. 
And so every university in the country that I am aware of is pretty much following this Yale model of investing. And we're going to talk a little bit later about 2008, and we all probably are aware of what happened then. And this is really um, a cornerstone, this model of investing that prioritizes non-transparent private funds over um, lower risk things like municipal bonds. Um, and that again is an example of how something that started in the university space has transcended and uh, transformed the entire financial sector. Uh, another moment moving into the 90s, and at this point we see that sort of neoliberalism has transcended party lines. It's not a Republican or a Democratic issue. Um, under President Clinton, actually, in 1993, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement is passed. And this is something that actually brings down uh, some, some of the laws that protected a lot of industries in different countries, like uh, Mexico, uh, Canada, the United States. And so once, once this uh, free trade agreement is passed, it frees the flow of goods be and, and services between these countries. Uh, it frees the flow of capital between these countries, but not the flow of people. So uh, once, once uh, cheap, subsidized American corn floods into Mexico, for example, uh, you may have heard of this example, 15 million Mexican farmers uh, lose their livelihoods. And at the same time, the Mexican government, because of the policies of NAFTA, is unable to help them. And people have to help themselves in, in many cases by migrating to where the jobs are north of the border. And you'll see just three years later, um, a really important policy regulating immigration was passed called IRERA, the Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act. This act criminalized the same people that were disenfranchised by the signing of the NAFTA free trade agreement. All of the farmers who could no longer farm because the market was flooded with U.S. subsidized corn and were moving to the United States were being caught up. And the same prison system that we saw back in the 70s and 80s that was created really as a response as well to black power movements, as a way to divide folks within social justice spaces who were winning huge victories was being used once again to criminalize a new group of people, um, many of the folks that had been directly affected by the trade policies that we'd enacted. And I think this is a really important lesson to hold on to about neoliberalism, the way that it divides people. And every social movement that has one advances for uh, social justice, for public, uh, public services, has won it by changing the definition of citizenship. When the Constitution was founded, it was in service of landowning white men, and every single campaign that has run has changed that. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and so uh, the definition of citizen has been won, hard won, by organizing. And what we've seen is the opposition, really the folks that are that are. Uh, that do not want to see that defini definition expanded have actually turned to expanding the definition of who is a criminal as a way to um, make sure that these social movements um, get overturned, overthrown, and lose momentum. So I want to just hold on to this because it's something that really has impacted student organizing and community organizing um, since the, the founding of uh, many social movements. And uh, how many people here have heard the phrase, uh, too big to fail? Yeah, so um, this is getting into what happened uh, in, in the 2008 crash, right? But we talk about the date 1999 uh, because this is when uh, legislation, the Glass-Steagall Act, which had protected, uh, protected consumers, uh, it had prevented banks where the people's money is held from being unified with, with uh, sorry, investment banks and, and uh, insurance banks, uh, insurance companies. It had prevented them from being one unit. And so when this was taken apart, it really paved the way for seeing some of these mega banks that once uh, they, their activities got too risky and collapsed, uh, the government had no choice but to bail them out. Uh, so, so this is really a moment when that happens. And this cartoon is kind of illustrating what was going on at that time. Uh, really, the banks were getting bailed out when the people weren't. That, that was, that's kind of become something that we've recognized since then. However, um, so up to this moment, we've really been talking about how, these, how the system developed, how um, 
throughout, throughout the world in terms of trade policy, in terms of labor here domestically in our universities. Um, there are all these assaults on uh, human rights, on, on, on our basic rights and, and, uh, and expansions of rights for companies. So 1999 was an important moment actually in uh, Lawrence uh, hometown, uh, home state, in, in Seattle, Washington when we had the battle in Seattle. And so this was actually one of the first times, uh, but, not, but far from being one of the only times when labor, uh, environmental movements, uh, cooperators, and many other groups came together to, to put a foot down and actually made enough noise at the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference that the mainstream media had to change its narrative. Um, it, all the while it had been saying, you know, free trade, these policies are really good for everybody, they're improving the economy, but clearly they weren't. And so this really shifted the narrative. And in many ways it set the stage for the movements that are continuing today uh, from Occupy Wall Street uh, to Black Lives Matter to, uh, to, to the Wisconsin uprising that happened near, nearby here in the Midwest uh, and, and many other movements. And so I was in school in 2008. I started at Seattle University in 2007. And um, during 2008, we saw a financial crisis that hadn't, hadn't any, there had been nothing close to it for decades. And at my school, um, I felt it really personally because of some of the first things that happened. I remember opening my, my email um, one morning and seeing the university say, we have just lost about 20% of our university endowment's value. We're, we're, we've lost nearly $100 million. At schools like Harvard, where 22% of the endowment was lost and you've got an endowment that's $32 billion, you're seeing schools losing $10 billion over the course of a couple of months. And one thing that's interesting is you remember this endowment model of investing was started at Yale. Yale is another one of the schools that's got about between, at that time it probably had about $18 billion in its endowment. When you are $18 billion, $18, $18 billion rich and you lose 25 or 30 percent of your endowment, you can still bounce back. You, you're a multi-billion dollar endowment. But so many schools like mine that had endowments of under $500 million um, were just at a loss. They couldn't make up that money. There was no scheming that they could do that would get them enough money to bring that back in a short period of time. And so some of the first things that happened, there was a tuition increase. I think it was 9% the first year they, were, they, they said, we're going to raise tuition by 9% because we don't have an endowment um, that's going to allow us to, to graduate that. They said, we're going to cut down, we're going to cut some of the departments. Like, who needs a German department at your school? We're going to cut the funding for that program. And we're going to cut the staff and faculty that work in that program. And then they said, we're going to go back to our roots and uh, try and fight for Division I sports, because we think sports are the way that we're going to make up the losses here. And what that's led to is actually about a $7 million a year deficit in the athletics program. And so all of these things happen, and, and I'm sure anyone that's in the UC system is probably very familiar with tuition hikes. Um, and we saw this happening at a massive scale, and really we saw public universities and small endowment universities being hurt first and worst by the economic crisis because they had not had the resources to come back from this. And we also, though, saw some of the most resilient organizing um, come out of this where faculty and students were coming together, joining forces and saying we've got each other's backs and we're seeing that continue today. And we actually wanted to pause here and turn it to all the folks, you're in table groups right now and we wanted to ha uh, kind of set up uh, some discussion questions um, for you all to talk about for the next 10 minutes and we're going to have a brief amount of, of discussion afterwards. Um, but some of the key things um, that we're going to be talking about. Um, the first one is how has your university prioritized profit over the best interests of students, workers, families, and local communities? And the second question that we would like you to ask, to ask yourself and discuss is what is some of the most inspiring organizing that you've seen going on on your campus? And the last question, um, and this really puts the onus back on you as cooperators, is what is a campaign you could see your cooperative supporting in the coming year um, that would uh, help overturn some of these, these big egregious policies that have been coming facing students and, and parents on campus? 
So take 10 minutes in your, in your, dis, in your groups here and uh, start discussing these questions. We're going to come back and take some answers and hear what's going on around the country um, where each of you are coming from. I just say, what are you doing for us? All right. Sounds like there's some good discussions underway. Uh, we wanted to get out into the audience and hear a little bit about what you all have been talking about. And so I wanted to take some hands and see, uh, for the first question, how is your university currently prioritizing profit over the needs of your community? Um, can I take some hands for interesting things that came up in your discussion tables? Do you want to go there? Okay, we've got a hand over here. And would you okay. introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Chigi. I live at the Santa Barbara Student Housing Cooperative. And one way that the university is currently <laughs> prioritizing private profit over the best interests of the community is uh, this past summer they bought a couple apartment buildings with about 200 residents total, and they turned those into dorms. And in the process, they evicted the families and students of community colleges who were living there. So yeah, they have no place to live. They found others, I hope, but they didn't really have any recourse. Absolutely. Do we have some other examples? Yeah, there's, Ian, there's someone in the back there. So, um, oh, okay. my name's Rolana. I'm from Athens, Ohio, with SEO, and um, I go to Ohio University. And so, I guess neoliberalism kind of like uses grad students as um, professors without like pay, basically. Like, um, basically, like takes like exploits the labor of grad students, and, and like. They have to teach classes uh, the way that professors would without the same pay or benefits and while also taking their own classes. But then <laughs> um, I went to an advising meeting because I'm a senior and um, I need like more credits. My major is kind of, it's a new major and so they haven't figured out all the classes for the major. And so most of the classes that I need to graduate are not being offered. And so they would rather, instead of like offering the classes, like finding, like paying someone to teach it and like um, having like a building and a space for the class, they like told me that I could like basically TA a class and get credit. And so they're trying to, not only like do grad students have to do the work of professors and they like are underpaid and don't have the, uh, the like amount of benefits that they should have, they are now making undergraduates do work like professors, like they're exploiting the labor of undergraduates, and, but for credit. So I'm paying to work for the university. I'm paying mm -hmm. to not take a class, but to help teach a class, which is like, <laughs> like not what I paid for. <laughs> and so they're like, they're making money off of me because now they can teach this like 80, it's like 80 student class. Um, without paying me or giving me any benefits, just giving me credit hours. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Great example. Were there a yeah. couple more hands? Okay, got one over here. Sorry, where? Hey, y'all. I'm V, um, and I go to Ann Arbor, U of M. And so we talked about this table, uh, the fact that the school of business was, I mean, the person whose name was on the School of Business, Stephen Ross, did pay for this. Thank you, Monty, for clarifying that point. But nonetheless, the School of Business has recently expanded, and it paid $700,000 over the court, like for a 40-hour movement of a 250-year-old or so Burr Oak, which is 700,000 um, pounds. That's all I got. Yeah. So maybe putting the facilities uh, over the needs of expanding affordable tuition and other things, thinking about the resources. We've got one hand over here. 
I was just going to add to that. Sorry, y'all. I'm Coco, I'm also here at UM Ann Arbor. I was just going to add to that because that was something we discussed at our table and also that after student organizing around being black at the University of Michigan um, and the demands of the Black Student Union for more diversity and inclusion, the university finally agreed to give 500000 to creating a new multicultural center. Meanwhile, spending that $700,000 on the tree, um, just for some perspective of sort of the um, priorities of the university. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to take one more, and then we're going to transition into what people have been doing about it. Hello. Oh, my name is Graham. Uh, I'm from the Yuckshaw Cooperatives in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, our university, the University of Kansas, um, uh, consistently underpays and does not provide benefits for uh, faculty. So those faculty, on top of um, on top of uh, teaching, have to uh, teach at either community colleges or smaller universities elsewhere in the state, uh, and that does not allow them to do research, which is the, like the best way to advance themselves at KU. So they, they have like effectively three jobs teaching three different classes and cannot help students, cannot uh, progress their careers at all, and are kind of trapped in this loop of just working to the bone, basically. Yeah, thank you. So um, thanks for those really great examples. Um, we'd also like to ask for some of your responses to the second question, uh, which is what is some inspiring organizing Sorry, what is some inspiring organizing happening right now uh, on your campuses? And also one thing we uh, wanted to say as well is that we know that not everybody here is affiliated with a university campus, but uh, actually a majority of the cooperatives here do have some student members, and maybe a lot of you who aren't affiliated with a campus uh, have friends who are, in, who are affected by this. So, um, and, and we meant to, um, that to be reflected hopefully in your conversation. So yeah, um, do we have a few hands of people who uh, can talk about some inspiring organizing that you've seen happening or that you've been involved with and, or, or been leading on your campus. Are there, are there any people who talked about that? Okay. okay. Um, so I guess I got a question. Hi, I'm Zane. I'm in Chicago. Uh, how many of y'all have heard about the Million Student March or the Million Student Movement? Okay, sweet, awesome. So I'm one of the national organizers of that, and uh, we've expanded from like the Million Student March, which is November 12th, with three demands. One is $15 minimum wage for campus workers, two is debt cancellation, and three is free public education. Um, so we have a whole bunch of orgs on board for that out over 100 campuses for November 12th. I think co-ops could be huge in that. But tomorrow in Chicago, there's a uh, college student, you know, basically a walkout from Northwestern and a whole bunch of other universities where we have co-ops and stuff uh, because the budget right now, they're trying to cut the shit out of it. Anyway, um, we're running a guerrilla workshop in the opera room uh, in the next course block about the Million Student Movement and co-ops role in transitioning it from a march into a movement that can last for the next you know, long time, uh, and like build on everything that's going on. So I'd love if any of y'all come in because we're trying, I really think co-ops could be huge in it and that's part of the reason that we came up here. So opera room, um, next course block and learn more. So uh, uh, just a couple of things. So, uh, you know, we had a publication a couple of years ago called the Anchor Dashboard, and the Roosevelt Institute actually took that publication. They've been organizing on campuses, including UMass Amherst and University of Michigan, to try to uh, have some community accountability towards uh, community investment. So I think that's pretty inspiring. Um, also, the next system project is going to be organizing um, uh, teach-ins uh, in both in New York City and Madison around about February. So I encourage folks in those cities uh, to get involved with that. And uh, if anyone's interested, you know, please get a hold of me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Who else has organizing they want to shout out? Amazing, inspiring work happening um, in, on your campus, in your community. Um, things that you want to get other NASCO members involved in, perhaps? This is an opportunity to take the mic and tell us what you are proud of with your organizing. I saw a lot of hands when we started. All right. It's 
Jolana again from SEO. Um, one of our members in SEO, Ryan Powers, is so awesome. He works at a call center at our university, and he basically calls up alumni and asks them for donations to the university. So he's making money, like big money for the university. And um, this entire semester and throughout the summer, he has been working on unionizing the call center. And um, yeah, so he's been like talking to his like uh, fellow coworkers, um, getting them to sign union cards, and he's gotten I believe like about 80% of his coworkers to sign union cards, and they're gonna go up for an um, for an election in about like a month before the end of the semester, and the university has responded in bringing in anti-union uh, representatives, I guess, to like to um, basically to, um, yeah, to intimidate the coworkers into not unionizing. But um, Ryan has been like, <laughs> hasn't been sleeping, hasn't been doing his work, like he's all unionizing and he's just been like talking to people day after day and trying to get them to, um, to vote yes to the union because uh, we want better wages, we want a a better discipline system for our, in our jobs. We want to like stay in our workplace, and like we want this to continue throughout our campus, not just the call center, but like for all student workers. So, shout out to Ryan Powers. <laughs> awesome! Thank you for sharing that. How many folks, with a show of hands, how many folks have been seeing an increase in the use of force against students on your campus recently? Maybe campus security getting the, the local police involved when students have been organizing, things like that. Does anyone want to share of any, any moments that they've seen where, where this has happened, where student organizing has led to um, some, some increases in, in force? Hi, I'm Clara. I'm from Oberlin College. Um, so there was a black trans student who was trying to poster after the non-indictment of Darren Wilson last fall and was um, followed by safety and security, tackled, and eventually the police was called. The police were called and they were like, went to trial on like bogus charges of resisting arrest and I think, I don't even remember what else, um, but there was like a huge deal because they were just trying to poster and SNS is not supposed to um, chase people and also SNS was chasing them and a white student and told the white, gave the white student a warning but the black trans student was tackled and arrested. So we've been seeing examples like this all over the country. Recently, I was at Columbia University working with their fossil fuel divestment campaign, and they were planning a big speak out on the steps of their library. And when we were coming down from inside the dorm room where we'd been making some of the banners, there were actually 20 NYPD officers waiting for us outside the dorm that escorted us to the, the, the library steps. And I think one of the things here is Columbia had a huge victory. I don't know how many people know about this, but they divested from private prisons in June. It was a huge victory. It took two years of really incredible organizing to make happen. Um, but right now we're seeing they, they, um, Columbia Divest for Climate Justice just recently uh, launched a civil disobedience pledge as a part of their campaign. And within 48 hours had over 200 students, faculty, and community members pledge to take civil disobedience if the university didn't divest from fossil fuels. And I think this is something that's showing that we are uh, making a huge impact. And uh, the only way that we've ever won uh, victories has been through organizing. And so I really, um, I wanted to open, see if anyone else had any last things they wanted to close out with in terms of um, key things that other NASCO members should know about in terms of organizing coming up over the next year. Um, and then we wanted to just uh, create the space for people to head to the next workshops. <laughs> Any final things you want to shout out? This is a time for you all to share the work that you've been doing and opportunities. Right, okay. Thanks. I didn't mean to speak twice, but I think this is really relevant and also an interesting tactic that y'all can use back home. The Michigan Student Power Network, born in the basement of a co-op a few years ago, in Ann Arbor actually is running uh, candidates for the Board of Regents, trustees, and et cetera for three public universities in the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. 
And that those are like eight year voluntary terms. And so if you feel like you have people committed to the cooperative movement or radical leftist ideology and are in a position where they can financially support themselves while representing the student interest, pursue those people and see if they're interested in um, having like a base of students organized behind them. Thank you. Any last folks? All right. All right. Thank you for those amazing examples also. I mean, there's some really amazing things that we're all doing, our, our, our friends, our communities are doing to rise up against uh, the ways in which our universities are being changed from the top down. And, and I think a, a common pattern that we've seen is that the university is dividing uh, students, faculty, and staff. And, and often, I mean, we have multiple of these identities, but we get treated differently depending on, uh, on uh, so, so for example, a student may be treated one way as a student, but then they're also a student worker, and so they may be uh, treated by the university a different way in that, in that context. So it's really by uniting in these struggles that we've seen some, uh, some, some, uh, some movements against it, and, and we're going to move more into talking about what we're doing to fight that. We just wanted to kind of close out with some beautiful images of some of the organizing that's happened for the la over the last few years in response to the financial crisis and the, the increase in privatization. In the top corner, we've got Moral Mondays in North Carolina. I know we've got some people from North Carolina in here. Yeah, Moral Mondays have been a great way um, to fight for public education and, and other um, public services that have, are being privatized and shut down in the state. Um, we also have folks in the Wisconsin uh, State House um, after Governor Walker uh, cracked down on unions. I'm going to talk about some of the other ones. Yeah. Um, the picture in the middle on the top is from New York City, one of the large marches that we had uh, last fall, almost a year ago now, uh, with Black Lives Matter against uh, police brutality, including the murder of uh, Eric Garner in Staten Island and numerous other cases uh, that don't get mentioned as much. Uh, so this was another, another mobil mass mobilization that really had forced media narratives to change and really changed realities in the streets. And how many folks have heard of the I Don't Know More movement? I Don't Know More. I Don't Know More is a powerful indigenous resistance movement um, that it has spread all across North America. Um, and they've been engaging in stopping uh, the expansion of tar sands mining um, and protecting indigenous sovereignty um, in Canada and different parts of the United States. And these are all movements um, that there are ways that we can support as young folks. And so we wanted to leave you with these images of hope and these images of resistance. And thank you all for your time. And we hope that. Uh, you have had a fantastic experience at the NASCO Institute, and good luck with the rest of your day. Thank you.